And indeed, you may be seated. We continue our study this morning of Ephesians, so if you would take your Bible, as always, I encourage you to bring your Bible with you, and I'm going to be reading from the New American Standard uh, Version, as always, and we're in the fourth chapter, in verses 23 uh, through 28, a little different, we're going to stop short of what appears in your bulletin, so it would be verses 23 through 28 in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. So let's begin there. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. This is the word of God. Pray with me once again as we ask God, the Holy Spirit, to illumine our hearts. Precious Holy Spirit, we do pray you illumine our hearts and minds as we study uh, this portion of Holy Scripture. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. And so returning to verse 23, we read there, once again, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, we have been talking about genuine conversion, what actually genuine conversion is, and we've been talking as well about the need for our cooperation in that continuing work that we understand to be termed sanctification. Today we're going to continue with our consideration of the renewal of our mind and how our mind, as it is renewed in conformity to what the Word of God says, that will work itself out in our attitudes and our behavior. And again, this is what we understand to be sanctification. There is a spiritual dimension to the mind of a man. That mind, that mind of each one of us is either inclined toward what is wicked and unholy and untrue, or it's inclined toward what is righteous, holy, and true. Before the fall, before the fall of Adam and Eve, Adam's mind in a state of innocency was inclined toward the righteous and the holy and the true. After the fall, though, Adam's mind was fallen and it was, it was corrupted and he was inclined toward evil and impurity and, and falsehood. This side of the fall, Adam's posterity, you and, and me, all of men, share in this inclination uh, that Adam brought upon us toward evil, impurity, and falsehood. But after a man is born again. That phrase that our Lord used in the third chapter of the Gospel of John uh, for regeneration. When God the Holy Spirit takes our heart of stone and he quickens it and replaces it with a heart of flesh, quickens us to the truths of the Gospel and the Word of God. After a man is born again, he once again is inclined toward righteousness and holiness and truth. In verse 24, look at it if you would. And put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. When an unregenerate man attempts to do what the apostle is telling us to do here, it simply doesn't work because it doesn't fit who he is. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the idea of not fitting. Now, most of us here, except for maybe a few of the more disciplined folks here, probably have a whole couple of, of tears in their wardrobe, tears, T-I-E-R-S. Uh, they probably, or you probably have... Uh, uh, a bunch of clothes that used to fit you, 
uh, but they don't now so well, and you don't want to get rid of them because you're expecting that they'll fit you again, right? <laughs> and then you've got the clothes that you wear now. Sometimes we have, you know, not just two sets of clothes, but three or four, you know, and, and uh, that's, that's true of many of us. But when you actually suppose that, well, I think I've got, gotten myself back down to the place where I can or I can uh, wear the clothes that used to fit me, and you put those pants on, and you realize, well, not so much. They're still quite tight. Then you're aware that, that you know, you're really not what you thought you probably were at that particular moment in time. And, and if, you, if you squeeze yourself into them, you know, and force the issue, then, then you're just hoping that you don't split a seam or pop a button or your zipper doesn't come apart, as sometimes that happens, doesn't it? But a man who's been truly born again, regenerated, has been changed. And putting on the new self not only fits, it's what he wants to do. Now Paul begins telling us here in verse 25. Read it with me. Laying aside falsehood, speak the truth, each one of you, to his neighbor. What the apostle is doing here is quoting the prophet, the minor prophet Zechariah in verse or chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. Let me read those two verses for you. These are the things you should do. Speak the truth to one another. Judge with truth and judgment for peace in your gates. Also, let none of you devise evil in your heart against another. And do not love perjury, for all these are what I hate, declare the Lord. What a terrible, terrible place for someone to put himself into by becoming a false witness, a perjurer against another person. You know that commandment, do not bear false witness, the ninth commandment in particular speaks of one who would bear false witness against another person with the intent of bringing injury or pain upon that person. It's not just, as many say, telling a lie. You get into the questions, well, what about white lies and all that kind of thing? But really, the point of the Ninth Commandment is more looking out for the best interest of others with our words, with what we say, and even being willing uh, to call others' attention uh, to falsehoods that might injure our brother. You know, I, I, I don't think that we could find any place that does a better job of extrapolating what, what bearing false witness actually means uh, than the Westminster lar Larger Catechism. And rather than go through both what is, what is commanded in the Ninth Commandment and also what is forbidden, I'm just going to read the portion uh, relating to what is forbidden. So that's in the larger catechism, question 145. What are the sins forbidden in the ninth commandment? Be patient, it's kind of lengthy. The sins forbidden in the ninth commandment are all prejudicing the truth and the good name of our neighbors as well as our own, especially in public judicature, giving false evidence, suborning false witnesses, wittingly appearing and pleading for an evil cause, outfacing and overbearing the truth, passing unjust sentence, calling evil good and good evil, rewarding the wicked according to the work of the righteous and the righteous according to the work of the wicked, forgery, concealing the truth, undue silence in a just cause, and holding our peace when inquiry calleth for either a reproof from ourselves or complaint to others speaking the truth unseasonably or maliciously to a wrong end or perverting it to a wrong meaning or in doubtful and equivocal expressions to the prejudice of truth or justice, speaking untruth, lying, slandering, backbiting, detracting, tail-bearing, whispering, scoffing, reviling, rash, harsh, and partial censuring, misconstructing intentions, words, and actions, flattering, vainglorious boasting, thinking, or speaking too highly, or 
too meanly of ourselves or others, denying the gifts and graces of God, aggravating smaller faults, hiding, excusing, excusing or extenuating of sins when called to a free confession, unnecessary discovering of infirmities, raising false rumors, receiving and countenancing evil reports, and stopping our ears against just defense, evil suspicion, envying or grieving at the deserved credit of any, endeavoring or desiring to impair it, rejoicing in their disgrace and infamy, scornful contempt, fond admiration, breach of lawful promises, neglecting such things as are of good report, and practicing or not avoiding ourselves or not hindering what we can in others, such things as procure an ill name. Now, isn't that pretty comprehensive? That's an amazing, an amazing elaboration of what bearing false witness uh, prohibits in us. And it's important, I think, to have a comprehensive understanding of this. Now, continuing then in verse 25, for all are members of one another. So again, the context here is that Paul is telling us not to speak falsehood to our neighbors. And now he's calling us back to our appreciation for and awareness for the fact that we are part of an organic body of Christ. We're part of the church. And so in 25, for all are members of one another, that takes us actually back to verses 15 and 16 in our Chapter 4, let me read that. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body, listen to this, this is the end, for the building of itself in love. And so as we read that, we have an idea of what our responsibility to one another is, which far exceeds what many of us might suppose uh, when we think of just that ninth commandment. Now moving on to verse 26, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now here's something that, that might surprise you. You've probably heard, read uh, this many times, but perhaps you haven't looked at it in just this way. Here we have God actually giving us permission to become angry. He's, he's telling us, he's, he's telling us that we can become angry, but with an important condition, that we are not to remain angry. That's important, isn't it? Skipping down to verse 31, the apostle tells us a little more about that. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And so we, we understand uh, that we uh, can be indeed angry, but we're not to remain in our anger, and especially and particularly, we want to be very careful not to allow a root of bitterness uh, to spring up in us. And that's exactly what will happen if we focus on our anger or the reason for our anger too much. When when the Apostle Paul uh, tells us that we should not let the, the night get away from us without putting away our anger, again, he's telling us that, that if you're wise, you are going to become angry. No need to deny that, that when you are angry, but you're not going to let this rule the way you think and operate and live and treat other people. Be not angry, or rather be angry and yet do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, what happens if we allow a root of bitterness to result from our anger? Well, read verse 27. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Now, there's three agents of temptation. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And the devil is often involved in temptations to sin, isn't he? And so what the apostle's saying here, and he's, he's really, I, I love it when he talks about uh, the devil or things of that kind, because in our modern day, 
These are not things that most folks think much about. Uh, but he does it in such a straightforward manner. You know, he's not, he's not trying to convince us that the devil exists. He's telling us the reality of the danger that he presents to us. And he's telling us that if we allow ourselves to become angry and we don't do something with that anger, we allow ourselves to become embittered toward other people or another person, then what's going to happen is Satan's going to see that vulnerability and he's going to come in there and whisper in our ear and cause us to do something uh, that we ought not to do. And it becomes much more serious then. We were having a problem with anger and bitterness, and now perhaps we're doing something terrible. The best example I think Scripture gives us of this is very early in Scripture, in the fourth uh, chapter of Genesis. You're familiar with this, but let me read it to you. And listen, if you would, to the progression here. Uh, of how anger becomes something else entirely. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering he had no regard. Listen to this. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. And then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. In other words, you're going to be tempted to do something worse. Sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about uh, when they were in the field that Cain rose up and against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. Now, you see the progression here? We have a situation, first of all, in which Abel wants to worship God on his own terms. He brings an offering that had not been commanded by God. He brings an offering of his own making. Now, if you were to consider the difference between the two offerings here, and this is not really the essence of the point I'm making, but it's nevertheless important. The offering that Cain brought probably required a great deal of more work. You know, I mean, farming is hard work. And so he brought uh, the fruit of the produce from his, from his farm, uh, farming endeavor. But Abel, he brought the firstlings of his flock, so he was a shepherd. And as hard as Cain perhaps worked for the offering that he brought the Lord, the Lord didn't receive it. And so what was Cain's response? Was it repentance? No, he became angry, and we're not told this specifically, but I think that we can, can see it implicitly uh, that Cain became angry at God. Cain became angry at his lot in life. He became angry at the providence of God here, that he wasn't getting exactly what he wanted. He was recognizing that he really wasn't uh, autonomous. He had a master. He had someone that he had to submit to. Now, in becoming angry at God, he soon became angry. It was, it was redirected from God to his brother, Abel. And Abel was an innocent party in this instance. And he takes Abel out, and he actually commits patricide. He kills his brother. So this anger resulted in murder. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Paul must have had in mind in warning us that it's okay to become angry. In fact, if you never become angry, it's a little strange. But you better be careful. You better be very careful about what you do with that anger because that anger can become something uh, much more destructive if you allow it to. So it's very important. Now in verse 28, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Now, you know, we, we're getting quite a picture, aren't we, of, of 
uh, the, the Christians in the church in Ephesus before their conversions. You know, we're, we're hearing about false witnesses and, and liars, uh, people who are angry, perhaps embittered, uh, thieves, and, and people who, who really don't want to work. And this is the kind of folks uh, that were saved and converted there to faith in Christ in the church in Ephesus. But the encouragement to do honest work is tied to a purpose beyond accumulating wealth and, and stuff. It's to put us in a position in which we can actually help others who may be in need. As an aside, uh, let me make a cultural comment here. Indifference to the poor around us and the needy uh, that might be in our lives, that we might come across in the course of our days, whatever we might be doing. When we're indifferent to folks who are in genuine need, this is an indication of a much deeper moral problem. Listen, if you would, to Ezekiel. Perhaps you've never caught this before. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 through 50. And he's going to talk here about, about the sin of Sodom. Now, if I ask you, what was the sin of Sodom? You, you would say, well, it was uh, sodomy, homosexuality, wouldn't you? Well, listen, listen, maybe it wasn't just that simple. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease. But she did not help the poor and needy. This they, thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me, and therefore I removed them when I saw it. What the prophet is telling us there is that there's often a root cause of sin. In this instance, it was an arrogance. And then it's often manifested in various sins. And in the instance of Sodom, uh, the being indifferent to the needs of the poor, selfishness, self-centeredness, personal aggrandizement at the cost of others, perhaps. And that's always accompanied with other sins. You know, you don't really find a situation where, where someone commits or where you have a culture given over to one sin and there are not other sins associated with it. That's the way it is. And so the apostle understands that and he's trying to help us uh, to put these things off, but rather to put on the things that fit as Christians, the commandments of God, both by the letter and the spirit of the commandments. Now, let me summarize with four points here. First of all, and this is important, there is a difference between uh, reformation and regeneration. Reforming one's behavior, and we could read what I've just gone through, and you could you can mistakenly understand uh, what you're hearing uh, to be urging you toward uh, reforming your behavior, changing how you behave. Reformation is focusing on the external, the behaviors itself. But regeneration begins on the inside with the change of our heart and our soul, and then it works itself out in our behavior and our attitudes and our words. This is what Paul's encouraging. He's encouraging in us, not, not reformation, but, but that we would, we would act in accord with in conformity to the ongoing work of sanctification by God the Holy Spirit. That's the first point. Second point of summary. It matters what we think about God. We've been We've been hearing that in the last two weeks as we're studying this particular part of Scripture. It really does. It matters how we think about God, uh, what we think about God. This will determine quite often what we think about ourselves and what we think about other people. It, in other words, if you have an erroneous understanding of who God is, you'll find that that plays itself out uh, in the way you look at yourself. If you don't understand that God is infinitely uh, higher than us, transcends us remarkably, then you won't understand perhaps what a lowly creature you really are. That's not a popular thing for folks to hear or to say these days, but it's the truth. And so it's very important for us to learn what God reveals to us in Holy Scripture. This is a spe special revelation. And, and how we know precisely who and what God is is because he has revealed that to us in Scripture. I'll just give you a couple of examples. 
we read in Scripture, and you know this, that God is love. But, but just as surely as God is love, He is also just and holy. We know from Scripture that God is merciful, but, but He is also wise. We know that God is compassionate, but He is also immutable, unchanging. We know that God is sovereign, and that all authority rests with Him by the virtue of the fact that He is the Creator and the sustainer of the universe, but he is also gracious and forgiving. God is infinite without limits. He is transcendent. He exists over, above, and beyond his creation. But he is also imminent and condescending. He sent to us his only begotten son to live amongst us, to take on the nature of a man while remaining truly and fully God. And submitting himself to the miseries of, of, of this fallen world, and then even giving himself as our Redeemer on the cross. Yes, God is most certainly imminent. He's not simply a distant God who's disinterested in his creation or his creatures, but he sent Christ to change us, didn't he? The third point, the ninth commandment is normally understood. I mentioned this earlier. The ninth commandment is normally understood uh, that we simply shouldn't tell lies. But it's much more than that, as we heard in the larger catechism. The ninth commandment makes us responsible to tell the truth about others, but it also compels us to defend those who are being slandered and those who are falsely accused are being lied about. You know, we should be just as concerned for the well-being and the reputation of other people, for our neighbors, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we are ourselves. If we're not just as outraged when we hear a falsehood being spoken about our brother, our sister in Christ, as we would be if someone were slandering or accusing us falsely, uh, then our heart's not right. I've seen folks over the years remain silent uh, when I knew that they could, they could refute uh, a false narrative that, that false accusers and slanders were spinning. And, and I, I wondered sometimes, uh, because perhaps I wasn't in a position or, or I didn't have the opportunity to, to actually stand up and, and call those people to account that were spinning those false narratives, I wonder sometimes, why, why would they not speak up? Why, why wouldn't they, they defend the reputation of their brother or their sister in Christ? Perhaps, you know, perhaps they just didn't want conflict. A lot of folks will go around the block rather than to face someone and have a conflict. I understand that. But sometimes, I think more often than not, I'm afraid, they're afraid that the, that the accusers are going to turn their guns on them. They're, they're afraid that if they get in the middle of this conflict, that pretty soon they're going to be the target of the conflict. And, you know, sometimes silence is not so much gold, and you've heard this before, I know. It's often yellow. The fourth point, anger can cause tremendous destruction. But, and again, this is not something you'll hear a lot, I don't think, from a pulpit, but properly dealt with, it can also be a, a source of constructive change. It can, for example, it can, it can move a person to correct an injustice. Consider our Lord's righteous indignation when he went into the outer courts of the temple and cast the money changers out. He was angry, but it was a righteous anger, and it resulted in a righteous action. Many of the best movements, socially and otherwise, that have occurred have been the result of someone becoming angry at injustices that they witnessed and their willingness to do something constructive to correct the injustice. Secondly, anger can reveal things to us that we have in our hearts, but we didn't know that we had that in our hearts. Think about it this way. Sometimes the things that make us angry I'm, taking, I'm talking especially about the things that make us angry repeatedly over and over. Maybe, maybe it's God showing us something in ourselves, some problem that we have in our, 
in our own heart. He did that, didn't he, with Cain? You know, Cain didn't understand uh, that he had actually been given over to idolatry. His anger, if Cain had had the discernment to figure it out, his anger revealed that the problem was, wasn't with his brother Abel uh, that he was jealous of, but rather the problem was in the condition of his heart. Sometimes anger tells us something about ourselves if we're willing, if we're willing to be honest and objective about ourselves. And this third and final subpoint here, it's a little, it's a little more nuanced. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into it, but if you have questions, I'd be glad to talk to you uh, later on about it. In God's providence, anger, anger can close one door and it can open another. Sometimes, sometimes God moves us to become angry in a particular situation because He wants to move us, quite literally. That's how sometimes we see His providential hand in our lives. Let me pray for you. Our Father and our God, uh, this... this is a passage of scripture that we've been studying that is so very practical and it I believe it touches everyone here in one way or another it certainly it certainly does me I confess that I fail in so many ways to live up to what I understand of your commandments and your revealed will and I'm unhappy about it I'm distraught by it sometimes I'm undone by it I pray, Father, that all here would be undone by their, their sinful proclivities, the, the willingness to pursue temptations they know might lead them to committing some sin or another, that, that we would recognize our vulnerabilities and not have too high an estimate of ourselves. I pray, Father, for each one here that you would give the gift of, of repentance and true humility that we would see living in dependence on you is a good place, a good way to live. Help us, Father, to recognize that we were created to be dependent upon you, to live under your rule and authority. We were not created to live autonomously. And that is often worked out in our interaction with one another. You have created us as Christians to live in a faith community with people that sometimes will make us angry or at the very least irritate us. And it's in those times that we can grow as believers and Christians as we learn to love one another as we love ourselves. Help us to cut other people slack when they offend us in the same way that we hope that others will cut us slack when we offend them. Help us, Father, uh, to be willing to practice what we preach, the love of Christ, even to the unlovely and the unlovable. We're reminded of that love in the simple gospel of Jesus, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures for our justification. We know, Father, that each one here today participating in this time of worship that believes the gospel has been given the gift of faith by you so that they might trust in Christ alone for salvation and redemption. And if there's one here now who's yet to place his complete trust and dependence upon your gospel, on Christ as he's offered in the gospel, if there's one here, we pray for the conviction, for the convincing, for the persuading, for the effectual call to Christ as he's offered in that gospel, that they would be soundly converted and they'd not be looking at scriptures that talk about behavioral modifications as an opportunity to reform one's behavior, but they first of all would recognize they must be regenerated, born again by the Spirit of God and then given that gift of faith to believe. I pray for each one here, Father, as pastor, uh, that you would love them, call them to your side, help them to navigate the challenges in their lives, the trials, the tribulations, that all of these uh, would be opportunities for growth, 
that you would strengthen those here who are struggling, whatever that struggle might be, some struggling with a chronic illness of one kind, another with, with the difficulties of growing older, and some with a challenge in a relationship, perhaps with a covenant child or with a husband or a wife or a sibling, an extended family member, perhaps even a neighbor. We commit this to you, and we trust you with the outcome. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen.